Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of Chapter 2 of the book titled Ananda Murti, The Jamalpur Years. School Days You must have a flaming moral purpose so that greed, oppression, and exploitation shrivel before the fire in you. By the time Pravat turned five, he'd begun his lifelong practice of sitting for meditation early in the morning and again in the evening. No one in the family knew when he had started this practice or how he had learned it, nor would he say. But by then the family had learned to leave the independent-minded young boy alone about such matters. Nearly as unusual was his refusal to eat any non-vegetarian food. Despite the fact that his family was not strictly vegetarian, like most Bengali families, the Sarkars ate fish, and on infrequent occasions, other non-vegetarian items. When Pravat was still a toddler, he used to weep quietly whenever his grandmother brought live fish from the market and began preparing it. When they first noticed this, they thought something was wrong with the boy. But when they saw that he only reacted this way when they brought live fish to the kitchen, they stopped doing so. The Sarkar family followed the Indian tradition of feeding their children a vegetarian diet until they reached the age of four or five. In accordance with the popular belief that the delicate digestive system of a young child is not ready for meat, fish, or eggs, when Pravat reached the socially approved age for eating non-vegetarian food, they attempted to feed him fish, but he refused to eat it. His parents didn't mind all that much. A large section of the society was vegetarian for both religious and health reasons, and as good Hindus, they conceded the value of a vegetarian diet. Indeed, his mother rarely ate any non-vegetarian food. Pravat's grandmother, however, had quite a different reaction. For centuries, people in Bengal have believed that fish promotes the growth of the brain and stimulates intelligence, a tradition that Bengali grandmothers have carried on proudly through the ages. Vinapani grew increasingly exasperated with her favorite grandchild, who refused to eat what he was served. She tried cajoling the boy, telling him how important fish was for the brain. You don't want to grow up to be stupid, do you, just because you won't eat fish? None of her entreaties, however, were able to move her intransigent grandson. Finally, one day at dinner, fed up with Pravat's stubbornness, Vinapani forcibly shoved a piece of fish into his mouth. Pravat spit it out on the dining table. You foolish boy, his grandmother said. Do you want to be a dolt all your life? Prabhat got up from his chair and told his grandmother that if she or anyone else ever tried to force him to eat non-vegetarian food again, it would be the last time he would sit at the family table for a meal. Then he turned around and went to his room, shutting the door behind him. Neither his grandmother nor his mother ever brought up the subject again. Prabhat would live the rest of his life without ever once swallowing a morsel of non-vegetarian food. It was at this age that Prabhat started attending the Bengali primary school, where he soon earned the nickname Encyclopedia. For his prodigious memory and his seeming ability to answer any question the other boys put to him. During the four years he spent there, his personality underwent a slow, almost imperceptible metamorphosis, from a gifted, fun-loving child into a quiet, far-seeing youth whose hidden debts set him apart from the rest of the boys in ways that often took more than a second glance to notice. Bihar in those days was the most caste-conscious state in India, a place where going against the deeply ingrained mores and behavioral rights of Hindu society was practically unthinkable, especially in a small town such as Jamalpur, where failure to observe caste prescriptions was certain to bring immediate reprobation. Pravat's family followed the orthodox practices, just as every Hindu family did. But Pravat, in his quiet way, gradually made it clear that he had shared none of their caste consciousness. One day he invited a scheduled caste boy to his room, and they sat together on his bed. Abarani didn't say anything while the boy was there, but once he left, she rebuked her son and complained to him that she would have to wash the bedsheet and pillowcase as enjoined by the scriptures, since they were now polluted. 
Pravat listened to her without saying a word. After she had removed the sheet and the pillowcase, he grabbed the mattress and the pillow, took them outside to the wash basin, and started immersing them in water. What on earth are you doing? Abarani shouted. Since you say that everything is polluted, Pravat replied, then these are also polluted. I am washing them as well. His exasperated mother tried to make him understand his foolishness. That is not necessary, she told him. We have to wash the pillowcase and the bed sheet because the boy touched them. But we only need to sprinkle some Ganges water on the mattress and the pillow. No, Pravat replied, continuing to wash the mattress and pillow. If you say that the bed sheet and the pillowcase are polluted, then everything is polluted. His mother tried to argue with him, but without success. Finally, she threw up her hands and exclaimed, It's very difficult to convince you of anything. On another occasion, Pravat was sitting on the porch in front of his house. There was an empty platform across the road where people from the neighborhood would often gather to chat or play cards. A member of the so-called untouchable class, who was walking along the road, stopped and asked Pravat if he had seen a certain person or knew where he might find him. He addressed Pravat as Koka Babu, little gentleman. Pravat was surprised to see that the man stood on one leg while he asked his question and remain in that posture while he waited for his reply. I know who he is, Pravat said, but I don't know where he might be at this moment. Please come and sit on the bench. You can wait for him here if you like. Koka Babu, the man replied, I cannot do that. There is a rule that a low caste person has to remain in this position whenever he goes to a big man's house. Pravat requested him several times, but the man would not sit or put down his leg. The injustice of the custom angered Pravat, but he knew the futility of saying anything more at the moment. So he held his tongue. When the man left, however, he swore to himself that he would fight this ugly tradition and help to put an end to it one day. Throughout Pravat's childhood, the family paid frequent visits to Lakshmi Narayana's native village of Vamunpara, especially during the hot summer vacation when the abundant vegetation and open spaces provided a cooling respite from the unremitting heat of Jamalpur. Summer was mango season, and Bamumpara was full of mango trees, as well as papaya, banana, jackfruit, guava, and many other delights that made the Sarkar children look forward all year long to their Bamumpara vacation. Like most Indian children, they adored sitting in the cool canopied shade of those huge arching trees, sipping the sweet juice flesh of its tree-ripened fruit. Afterward, they would run off to play with the village children and roam the fields that ringed the village. Pravat also loved mangoes, but while his siblings were playing, he would often seek out the shade of those same trees for long sessions of silent meditation, or go for long solitary walks through the fields or to the neighboring villages. At other times, he would spend hours reclining on a cot with his eyes open, staring off into space. On one of those visits, his sister Hiraprava, then 14 and a sensible young woman, asked her seven-year-old brother what he was doing lying down all day. I'm reviewing the history of the universe, Prava told her, an answer that did little to please his sister. The next day she asked him again. This time he replied, I am watching what is going to happen on this planet after a thousand years. Finally, Hida Prava got fed up with her lazy younger brother. She started taunting him for his idleness. There you are, wasting your time doing nothing. You still haven't even learned how to write your own name in your mother tongue. Pravat looked at her for a few moments with his typical silent smile. Then he went to a drawer, pulled out a piece of paper and a pen, and wrote out his name in ten different scripts, including English, Arabic, and a number of different Indian scripts. His sister was so startled when she saw this that she flew away like a frightened bird and avoided her brother for the remainder of their vacation. Years later, while giving dictation to one of his disciples, Vijayananda, Pravat reminisced about that vacation in Bambumpara. He told them that while he was lying on his cot, supposedly idling away his hours, he was busy planning out his life's work, which would include his fight against the caste system and other social evils, 
It was during that vacation, Prabhat said, that he devised the coming structure of Ananda Marga, the social spiritual organization that he would found in 1955, more than 25 years later. Then he went to his desk and pulled from a drawer a yellow piece of paper that he smoothed out on the desktop in front of his disciple. The faded writing, still clearly visible, contained an outline of the organization he would later create. In 1930, Pravar was admitted into the East India Railway High School, where he would continue his studies through matriculation. The boy that entered the Railway High School was now very different from the boy who had entered primary school a few years earlier. While the rest of the boys were on the whole boisterous and restless, Pravat's quiet demeanor and thoughtful way of speaking set him apart. When one word would do, he would never use two. He was friendly with everyone, but did not take part in the typical merriment during free time and recess. He kept to himself, either sitting under the large pipo tree in the courtyard, with a book, or on the veranda. Although whenever any skirmishes broke out, or the boys used uncouth language, he was quick to get up and intervene. From time to time, other boys would approach him to discuss one topic or another, often concerning problems they were having with their schoolwork, but mostly they respected his love of solitude. Bravat's reputation for being able to answer anyone's questions followed him from primary school. Here also it became a common practice among the other students to send them anyone who had questions no one else could answer. One afternoon, he and his classmates were sitting around a table during recess looking at a new geography book that had just arrived. Pravat flipped through the pages along with everyone else. Then he closed the book and challenged them to ask him any question from any page. The other boys jumped to the challenge. They opened the book so that he couldn't see it and started asking questions. One by one, he answered them all correctly. They were impressed, but they had seen this before. Vimalendo Chatterjee, however, who had recently moved to Jamalpur from a small village in the Sohet district of East Bengal, had not. When he expressed his surprise, Pravar asked him the name of his village and then proceeded to describe it in minute detail right down to the division of the rice fields and the placement of the wells. The more Pravat went on, the more astonished Vimalendo became. Everything was exactly as Pravat described it. But how can you know all that? He finally burst out. Pravat gave a little grunt, as if in disgust. You people don't study, he said. That's why you don't know these things. It was only some years later that Vimalendo realized that the information Pravat had described so accurately wasn't found in any book. After school, Pravat would accompany the other boys to the fields outside of town, but instead of participating in their games, he would disappear into the nearby hills, generally reappearing before dusk to accompany his classmates back to town. In those days, the Karakpur hills were the gateway to a wilderness that few townspeople dared enter. It was two miles from the edge of town to the beginning of the stony ascent into the chiseled granite hills that had served for centuries as the natural southern defense for Monger, seven kilometers to the north, the ancient capital of the kingdom of Anga. Between the town and the hills lay many acres of spacious meadows and shady trees, as well as a natural reservoir that ran along the foot of the hills for several kilometers. Adults would go there to walk and children to play, except for the expansive areas to the east that belonged to the Railway Institute, off-limits to Indians in those days. Beyond the reservoir, a long narrow valley jutted into the mountain range, a forested area named Death Valley by local inhabitants, in memory of a fierce battle fought centuries before in which over a thousand warriors had died and been left as carrion for the many wild animals that lived there. In those days, Death Valley and the Karakpur Hills were a subject for whispered conversations. Wild animals lived there, tigers had been spotted, and according to some, the ghosts of the dead warriors still roamed the woods. Unable to find peace, 
and haunting the footsteps of anyone who dared enter their forbidden domain. On the opposite side of the reservoir from Death Valley, hundreds of stone steps had been carved into the mountainside. At the top of the 20 minute ascent, in the shadow of the forest, stood two old temples a Kali temple, from which the hill got its name of Kalipahar, and a Shiva temple, a couple hundred meters further on, beyond which nobody dared go. The ascent to the Kali temple was breathtaking. Halfway up, one could see all of Jamalpur. From the top, on a clear day, it was possible to see past Munger, on the banks of the Ganges, to the Gangetic plains beyond. On weekends and religious holidays, pious pilgrims from Jamalpur and Munger would climb to the Kali temple to worship before the image of the Divine Mother and tie ribbons on the branches of the ancient gnarled bell tree behind the temple. It was said that Mother Kali would grant the wishes of those who left ribbons for her or her favorite tree. And every pious-hearted mother of Jamalpur had a son or a daughter who needed the Divine Mother's favor. But once the sun started dipping toward the tree line, in late afternoon, Kali Pahar would become deserted. For it was well known that Kali would not promise safe passage out of that wilderness to anyone foolish enough to remain there once dusk set in. Kali Pahar, Death Valley, and the Karakpur Hills became young Pravat's private retreat, a vast wilderness that he had practically all to himself. He would sometimes be seen climbing into the hills at the same time that the last of the pilgrims were coming down from the temples. On more than one occasion, while wishing neighbors, who recognized a boy, let his father know that they had seen his son wandering in those dangerous hills at an hour when no right-minded person would dare think of going there. When his father questioned him about it, however, Pravara assured him that the neighbors were exaggerating. He simply liked to walk where it was quiet, so he can think. It was more or less the same answer he gave the other boys when they asked him what he did when he went there, though by then many of them were aware of his habit of searching out solitary places to meditate. Sometimes he would bring a bamboo flute with him and spend hours sitting in the hills, exploring the different scales and variations of Indian music. Sometimes it was a friend's Esraj. On the rare occasions that a friend or two accompanied him on his walk, he would talk of God and asked him to sit and sing the praises of the Divine. One of his friends told him once, If you keep this up, Prabhat, you're going to become a sannyasi. Many of those who knew him assumed he would. One afternoon, when Prabhat was eleven, Sachindranath Marik, who lived a few houses away from him and was two years his junior, could no longer contain his curiosity. Together with a couple of friends, Sachin decided to follow Prabhat into the hills. Excited by the prospect of spying on their mysterious elder classmate, the three boys were careful to stay out of sight as they followed Prabhat up a rarely used path that wound precariously up the hill and into the forest. Young boys as they were, they soon became scared, having heard stories about the tigers and other wild animals that supposedly roamed those forested slopes. At the top of the ascent, the path dipped again and disappeared into the trees. No longer able to see or hear Pravat, none of them dared to go any further. They decided to wait for him to come back. Some forty minutes passed, then Sachin saw something that made him shake his head and stare. He shouted to his two companions and pointed. Downwards from where they were standing, in a clearing among the trees, they saw Pravat riding at a gentle pace on the back of a tiger. They watched dumbfounded. As he got down from the tiger's back, patted it a few times, and watched it stroll off and disappear into the woods. When Pravat made it back to where they were waiting, the three of them accosted him at once with questions about the amazing sight they had witnessed. Pravat immediately denied it. Are you mad, he said. Me riding a tiger? Nonsense. You had better not repeat such a thing. Sachin refused to pay heed to Pravat's adamant denials. When Pravat still would not admit it, he threatened to tell his mother, a threat that only made Pravat laugh. Do you honestly think anyone will believe you, he said. Sachin didn't listen. When he got back to town, he told both his own mother and Pravat's mother what he had seen. Naturally, neither of them believed him. 
Abarani did take the trouble to question her son about it, but Bravat's indignant reply satisfied her. Please, mother, do you honestly think I can ride a tiger? They are just making up stories. Sachindranath and his friends were scolded for lying. When Pravat saw them the next day in school, he rebuked them for telling tall tales. Whatever scolding you received, you deserved it. After that, he avoided them. When they got a chance to ask him why he was avoiding them, Pravat rebuked them for spreading gossip. If you tall talk like that, what will people think of me? Am I an animal that I ride on a tiger's back? As long as you go around saying things like this, I will have nothing to do with you. From then on, they said nothing more about this or any of the other unusual things they noticed about Pravat, and he gradually resumed his easy friendship with them. A few years later, Sachindranath heard a story about a lady tantric said to be living in the forest of the Karakpur hills. People claimed that she had caught and tamed a tiger with her occult powers. He remembered the incident with Pravat and realized that he might have been going to the forest to visit her. Despite Pravat's denials, his careful reserve, and his marked dislike of drawing any attention to himself, his reputation in Jamalpur, especially among his fellow students, grew steadily. In the winter, when temperatures could drop to 3 or 4 degrees Celsius, once the sun went down, Pravat continued to wear shorts and a light t-shirt, while the rest of the boys wore woolen clothes. When they asked him if he had felt the cold, he said, No, you wrap your bodies with warm clothes, but what about your mind? Do you also cover your mind? But we don't feel cold in our mind. Well, the mind is made of the same material as the body. That's the reason I don't feel cold. Some of the younger boys started following Pravat around after school hours, accompanying him to the fields and waiting for him to return from the hills so they can walk with him back to town. The parents of one boy, annoyed because their child was coming home late each evening, scolded him for following Pravat around and asked him to stop. When he complained, they demanded to know what the attraction was. I feel good whenever I am near him, he said. Once when I saw Pravat stop on the road, I saw that he was surrounded by a brilliant aura. Anyone who is surrounded by an aura like that cannot be an ordinary human being, can he? His parents had no reply to this. After that, they made no further objections. Manoranjan Banerjee, who was several years junior to Pravat, had often seen him sitting for long hours in the Shiva temple in Keshavpur with his eyes closed, a sight that never ceased to impress him. One day he saw something that amazed him even more. One day, when I was studying in class six, a group of four or five bulls started chasing me down a narrow lane. I dropped my books and ran for my life. As I was running, I saw Bubuda standing at the end of the street. When I reached him, he shielded me from the bulls. Just before they reached him, they suddenly stopped and became as still as statues. I was amazed. Then he asked me to go and pick up my school books. I was frightened to do so, because in order to reach the books, I had to cross where the bulls were standing. But Bubuda repeatedly assured me that I had nothing to worry about. They would not harm me. I hesitated, but finally I walked past him and picked up my books. Then I went back to Bubuda. The bulls didn't move an inch the entire time. After I came back with the books, Bubuda waved his hand in the direction of the bulls. Only then did they move. They turned around and walked away. This incident made me realize that Bubuda had some special powers. Incident like this and Pravat's obvious spiritual inclinations lent to his growing reputation among his peers and neighbors as a spiritually elevated young man, doted with unusual powers. In the West, people might not have known what to make of him. Most people would have distrusted the stories they heard, but in India, with its long history of yogis and saints, Pravat was looked upon as another spiritually minded youth following in the footsteps of his illustrious forefathers. His family and most other families in the neighborhood his family and most other families in the neighborhood were aware that he was not an ordinary boy. His mother would later say that she secretly considered her young son to be a spiritual genius. But she never brought up the subject, nor did anyone else in the neighborhood. For thousands of years, their culture had taught them 
to respect the privacy of those whose minds were turned toward God. And in a small town in Bihar, during the 1930s, that tradition was still very much alive. It was while he was attending the railway high school that Prabhat had the definitive spiritual experience of his boyhood. He described it for Amit Ananda years later on that unusual winter evening in Ranchi. I have gone to the Jamalpur hills to do meditation. I am sitting at a particular place when I hear a voice whisper in my ear, Come with me. I will show you a better place to meditate. Follow me. I see no one, but I follow the voice whose presence I feel so clearly. The voice leads me to a particular spot and asks me to meditate. I begin to meditate. After a while, I hear it say, Are you mad? How long do you want to remain under the spell of Maya? Who do you think you are? P.R. Sarkar? Look, see who you are. In that moment, a reel of my past lives flashes before my eyes, and I realize who I am. In the afternoon of January 15, 1934, a terrible earthquake struck northern India, with its epicenter on the border between Nepal and Bihar, some 300 kilometers from Jamalpur. It measured 8.1 on the Richter scale and left 30,000 people dead. Mongir was practically reduced to rubble. Jamalpur, though not nearly as badly affected, suffered extensive damage. The Sarkar house partially collapsed. On the morning of the earthquake, Lakshmi Narayana had left for Calcutta to fix the date of Hira Prabha's upcoming marriage. When he returned the next morning at 5 o'clock, the entire family was waiting for him in the train station, wrapped in blankets after a night when the temperature had reached a record low. That day he took his eldest boys around with him to survey the devastation. What he saw left him shocked. Despite the damage to his own house, he plunged immediately into full-scale relief efforts. Taking leave from his job as an accountant in the Jamalpur Railway Workshop to treat patients and collect and distribute relief materials. Pravat's father was an accomplished homeopathic doctor who for years had spent weekends and holidays in his dispensary attending to long lines of patients, British as well as Indian. Many of them depended on him to keep their families healthy when they could not afford the expensive Western medicines that were slowly replacing tradition Indian healing practices. Now his skill as a doctor was put to the test, with the numbers of sick and injured far too much for the local medical community to handle. Not only did he treat patients, he also collected food, blankets, clothing, and medicine for distribution. Pravat organized a group of his friends and joined in by his father's side. What was left of the Sarkar house became a storage center for relief materials. In the weeks that followed, the entire family assisted Lakshmi Narayana in his efforts to relieve the tremendous suffering that surrounded them. In recognition of his efforts, the Bihar government soon put Pravat's father in charge of the distribution of relief materials for Munger district. After this period of arduous work and little sleep, Lakshmi Narayana's health gradually began to deteriorate. No one was able to diagnose the exact malady, and a trail of different doctors and different medicines began that met with little success. He passed away on February 12, 1936. Pravat was studying in class 9 when his father died. The oldest son, but still too young to support the family, his mother received her husband's provident fund from the railways to go along with their savings. But there was no pension for Indian employees at that time. And the change in their financial fortunes was drastic. Until then, they had been relatively well off by Indian standards. None of them had ever faced any financial hardship, least of all Pravat's mother, Abrani, who had grown up as a daughter of a well-to-do doctor from the Hooghly district of Bengal and then married into a middle-class family. Once the period of mourning was over, however, she took stock of the situation and instituted the necessary changes in the household so that the family could survive on its drastically curtailed income. The generous spending to which they were accustomed was no longer possible, but she made sure that the children did not want for any of the necessities of life. Neighbors who had been the recipients of Lakshmi Narayana's generosity and kindness came forward to help. His brother, 
Nirmal Chandra, visited every Sunday to make sure Avarani had what she needed to keep the family going. When Prabhat graduated from high school, he tried to convince his mother to let him find a job, but Avarani would not hear of it. It had been her dream to see Prabhat go to college, and nothing he could say or do could convince her otherwise. Thus, it was that in the fall of 1939, the family put Prabhat on a train to Calcutta, where he had been admitted into Vidya Sagar College. Thank you.